1 Corinthians 1 27 says God chose things the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they are wise and he chose things that are powerless to shame those who are powerful good morning revolution We're going to talk a lot about that today, as we have been. Can you turn me down a little bit, Carl? As we have been for the last, what, four weeks? God, uh, God doesn't do things the way we do. Yeah. So, if you're ready to uh, study God's word with me and let it bear its weight on your life, then I'm ready to teach it. I wish I could be that announcer, you know, the boxing guy. Are you ready? Right? You guys ready? I think I just did. Why don't we pray before we jump into God's word? We're going to need his help here today. Lord God, uh, I can't teach anything. Just a howdy doody doll in the hands of the creator. It's the best I could hope for. We need you, Holy Spirit of God, to lead us, to teach us, so we could worship the right way. You said that faith comes from hearing the Word of God. So I pray, Lord, that you will help me to just preach the Word of God. And Paul told one of his churches, I think it was the folks in Thessalonica, that he was blessed by them because when he came to them and he spoke with them, they realized that it was not just words, but it was actually the word of God. And I could only ask you, Lord, that you would allow us to have that privilege here today, that somehow you would use a very unlikely man like myself to somehow convey a message from heaven. And we need your spirit to do that, Lord. Faith comes from hearing. And we're here today because we want our faith built. And we believe that you've come here today for that same purpose, to build our faith. You don't need faith. We do. And so that's what we're asking you, Lord. We're coming to you and asking you to build our faith, that we might trust you more, we might worship you better. Help us to do that, Holy Spirit of God, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. So, hey, listen. Uh, the last, hey, I got a new Bible today. I'm excited about that. Um, for some of you that have been around here for a while, you guys remember Frankie G, right? Y'all remember Frankie G from Mount Dora? This is his Bible, man. Pretty cool, right? He never, there's a couple of notes in it, very, very little, but it was almost untouched. And he left it here a while back before he passed on. And so, and it's a brand new NLT, which is my Bible of choice. And my little old orange guy, he's just had it. You can literally see through the cover at this point. It's really, really bad. So before the thing completely falls apart up here one day, uh, I'm just going to switch over to this Bible. And I hate to admit it, but bigger print. Praise the Lord. So... Uh, I've been mentioning, I'm excited about that, new Bible, man, it's a new season of my life, a new season of ministry, so I'm excited to see what God's going to do with this brand new Bible. So, so 1 Samuel 16 is the verse we've been kind of like dwelling there for the last four or five weeks. It's been kind of like the life verse of our series, our unhero series, God's unheroes. I'm wearing my unhero shirt today, and it's not because I'm big and muscular and awesome in any way I could fit into this sermon. I saw myself in these sermons and I realized that, it's, that I'm not awesome at all. Michael? Amen. Thank you. <laughs> You're slipping. You're slipping. He had his mouth full. <clears throat> but uh, sometimes I set you up for that success. But I'm, I'm, not, I'm not super awesome in any way, but God has used my super unawesomeness to do some really cool things in, in the last 15 years. And so I saw myself in, these, in this series, you know, as we're going through the different characters in the Bible to see who God chose to, to do his kingdom work. And uh, so that's why I'm, I'm kind of celebrating that, that God would even be so kind to use me. I'm wearing my shirt today. 
And uh, they're cheap over at Walmart. If you guys want to get one, you can get one. And we could all wear Superman shirts next week. How dorky would that be? It'd be awesome. Um, I want to take a second before I jump into this. I just felt convicted to do this. I just want to uh, just take a moment. And I know that uh, several people watch, but I know there's one person that's watching, and she does all the time, and it's Miss Marty. And uh, I just want to say, Marty, that I know I speak for everybody here, um, but right now I just want to speak just for me because I know that everybody loves you and they miss you, but I just want to say that I dearly love you and I dearly miss you and look forward very much to getting a kiss right here. So uh, come on back home soon. You're loved and you're missed. So uh, that being said, I just want to say that uh, 1 Samuel 16:7 is kind of like our verse, right? And, and we've been, we, I've quoted it every single week so far, and it's this, it's kind of uh, inspiring to you if you don't think very highly of yourself. I don't know too many prideful people in the room, we all battle with it at times, but uh, overall, I don't think any of us are really high on themselves, right? And so this is kind of a cool verse because um, God says that he doesn't see things the way you do. So that's kind of cool, right? Because if he saw things the way we did, uh, we wouldn't do much. And we wouldn't accomplish much. And so this 1 Samuel 16, 7 is, a, is very inspiring and comforting and encouraging to most of us uh, that he doesn't see things the way uh, we see things. And that's kind of uh, an illustration of that 1 Corinthians 1, 27 verse, right? God, God did some things that we would never do, right? If we were going to have our own faith and start our, our own church and our own religion and we were going to save the world, we certainly wouldn't do things the way it says it in the Bible, Right now, Job wouldn't be in there, would it? No chance, right? So, so, but 1 Samuel 16, 7 is kind of like the cliff notes to a greater, more famous verse. We see in Isaiah 55, 8, you're familiar with this one. His ways are not our ways, and his thoughts are not our thoughts. And even as the heavens are above the earth, right, way up high. How far do the heavens go? Forever, Right? So as far as the heavens are above the earth, that space right there, that's how big the difference is between your thoughts and your ways and God's thoughts and God's ways, right? It's way, way different. And so listen, when you spend any time in this book, you realize that's way true, right? Way true. So here's some glaring examples of what I'm talking about. Like somebody does you wrong, and, and what, do we, like, what do we do normally? Don't, don't, sound, don't yell out your holy answer. Yell out your normal human answer. When someone wrongs you, you wrong them back. You go get them, right? That's just what happens. That's our norm. And Jesus says, I mean, we're even taught that. If someone, like you're taught in school, like if some kid picks on you, what do you do? You get them back. Make sure the teacher's not looking. I've heard that from parents. But Jesus comes along, he says in Matthew 5, I say, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Where do you learn that? Prior to reading the Bible, where on earth, you all come from different places, you're all different ethnicities, who taught you that? nobody right God's ways are not our ways and his thoughts are not our thoughts right who would do such a thing so I go up and I punch Michael in the face and instead of him punching me back he prays and loves me that doesn't make sense right right it doesn't make sense but that's what Jesus says to do it's very abnormal here so there's another one, right? Let me, let me ask you guys a question. Again, not the holy church answers, just legit people, normal question, okay? I want an answer. How many people in here have enough money and they just don't want or need any more and I'm good, right? Raise your hand. Okay, awesome, right? So how many people in here would like just a little bit more? I mean, it'd be nice, right? Like you didn't tell God any secrets. Like he knows, he knows, right? So, so how about this, right? How, how, how about this? How about Proverbs 11, 24, and 25? Give freely and become more wealthy. Be stingy and lose everything. He goes on to say the generous will prosper. 
Those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. So let me ask you a question. So, so you got, let's just say, like, this isn't going to really happen, but what if, it, what if you had a million dollars, right? And you had a million dollars, and you're like, you know, I got a million dollars right now, and, but if I can multiply this into, you know, like, $20 million, I can retire right now at 30, and I don't have to ever work again. I was, I was watching this guy who started that, that bar stool company, whatever it's called. I don't know. They, they, I don't know. But he, he's a trader, right? He came on the news the other day. He goes, well, I don't understand why anybody works. Why do you work? Just go buy stocks and companies that have letters in them and watch it go up. In our, he's, he's sitting there, you know, they're doing the, the, they're doing the interviews on, on Zoom and stuff. Now they get the little headphones in, you know what I'm talking about, right? He's sitting there in front of his computer talking to, I think it was Tucker Carlson. And he said, you know, it's funny because like while I'm, during this interview, I've, I got my screen right here. During this interview, I've made $600,000. <laughs> he's been talking for like three minutes. He's, and, and, and the guy's like, well, wh- why, why do you got to make more than that? Like, what's wrong? He goes, because you can't buy super yachts with a million. You buy super yachts with 60 million. And that's what I'm going to do, <laughs> right? So, so there's people with a lot of money, but sh- so you have to, like, do the right things with it, right? So let me ask you a question. So if you had the million dollars, how many, how many people have called, like, Charles Schwab and all these different brokerage houses and stuff and said, you go down to Rougie Wealth Management here in Tiberias and you say, hey, listen, I've got a million dollars saved up and I'd like to invest that so that I could make $20 million. I mean, people do that, right? Yeah, yeah all the time. No. Say not us. No. Right, right. Yeah. But, but, but they do, right? So how many, how many of those advisors on the other end of the phone, the first thing they do is say, awesome, we're, we're going to do that for you. So this is the first thing I need you to do. You got a million dollars. I need you to go down to your church and I need you to write them a check for $100,000 first to go help others be refreshed and then come back and we'll invest with the other 900 grand. Never would say that, right? Never. But what does God say? God says, give freely and become more wealthy. Be stingy and lose it all. The generous will prosper. Those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. So go down there and cut a check to 100 grand to the church so they can go feed people and help people and share the gospel in greater ways so they can have eternity. Go refresh them and come back with my 900 grand. No way. And God says, go do that. Crazy, right? His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts, right? These things that I'm sharing with you, they fly in the face of common thinking and practice. And you and all, you guys all know it. His ways are not our ways, right? How about the greatest example of this, right? So, so hey, the world's a mess, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to impregnate a virgin through the Holy Spirit. I'm going to have the baby born in a barn. He's going to be fully God, fully man. He's going to be the savior of the world. He's going to go to a cross, do nothing, and die up on that cross so that if you believe that that's your sacrifice and you bow your knee to that dude, you can live forever. Now, if you're going to write your own religion, how many people would have come up with that one? No one. And it's not that it's even stupid or bad. Who could even think of that? You lost me at pregnant virgin. Right? Right? But that's what he does. This is what he does. I, I, I've come to realize that we don't struggle much with his thoughts. I don't think we struggle much with his thoughts. You know, because we're like, well, he can think whatever he wants, right? He's God. That's an easy, that's a cop-out, right? Well, yeah, he can think whatever he wants. He can think whatever he wants, but it's his ways. We don't like his ways because his ways are beyond his thoughts. He stopped thinking. He started doing it. starts offending you. You don't like it. He's infringing on you, right? So we have a problem with his ways, not much of his thoughts, right? And we think we know how things should go, you know? This is the right way, God. This is the wrong way. And when it comes to the kingdom of God, what does he do? He chooses Moses, the, the felon runaway fugitive guy and Rahab the prostitute and Gideon the scaredy cat and Samuel the baby and David the wimpy kid playing a harp to go kill Goliath and lead an army to take over a nation this is who he uses to build his kingdom choosing unlikely people like that that's super foolish and exactly this completely powerless these people are powerless what's Gideon even said what could I do I'm, a, I'm the wimp of the wimps. All my people are losers. My family are ultimate losers. And I'm the biggest loser of all of them. And God uses him. And shrink, man, you guys love that story. He shrinks his army down to nothing. 
He says, I want you to take these 300 dudes and I want you to go take on that, what is it, 20,000? Powerless to accomplish his purposes. So the world thinks, that's, I love the word, he uses the, the, these powerless, foolish things to shame the wise and the powerful. Shame them. See, by nature, all of us think we know what we're doing. Read Romans 1, right? We all know that this is a God, but we suppress the truth and unrighteousness. That's what we do. We all think we know what we're doing, and none of us. Raise your hand if you know what you're doing. God practices what he preaches, right? He tells us to do some crazy stuff. Why? Because he does some, what we perceive at least, as crazy stuff. And so, are you guys ready to, for God's next unlikely hero, right? You ready? To, and here's the big thing, though. Not just talking about an unlikely hero, but are you ready to see yourself in the mirror of this message? See, that's the, re- that's the reason why I'm up here preaching this. It's not so we could talk about this next person and go, oh, that guy, that girl, you know, he or she was awesome. No, it's so that you could see yourself as Rahab. It's so that you could see yourself as Gideon. So that you could see how God responds to fools like that. And you can have hope because you're a fool and I'm a fool and I'm a loser and I've never amounted to much. But God is amazing and he does this crazy stuff so there's hope for me yet. That's why we're doing this, right? So now... This message here, not only is it going to be talking about a, an unlikely candidate, but this one's kind of a dangerous message. Because not only is this guy an unlikely candidate for great things, to wear a Superman shirt for the kingdom, but not only that, but once he's called by God, once he's chosen and called and says, come on, do this, failure after failure after failure from this person and, and sinners will run with that. Oh, so it's okay? Kind of like the, the Rahab thing. Don't think that because she's a prostitute and lied, and there's no evidence of her ever repenting of prostitution, stopping and turning. We know there's nothing in the Bible that says that that ever happened. But that, the message of Rahab isn't, hey, you can continue to sell your body for sex as long as you love Jesus. And see, we see that in a church a lot, don't we? hey, God knows my heart. Yeah, he does. It's wicked and evil. And that's why you're doing that, right? I know I'm living in a homosexual relationship, but God knows my heart. Yes, he does. And that's why you won't inherit the kingdom of God, right? So, so, so these messages are not green lights to sin, okay? So when I say this person failed and failed and failed, but still got used for a mighty thing, that doesn't mean fail, fail, fail. (laughs) That's not what this is about, okay? So don't, don't hear me saying that. Okay, what, what you hear me saying is that the call of God to a person is instantaneous. Moses is walking along, right? And all of a sudden, out of a bush, Moses. Boom, right there, it happened, right? Samuel's in bed next to the, next to the altar by, the, by the, 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 the Ark of the Covenant. And what happens? Samuel, Samuel. In that moment, he got called. So the call is instantaneous, But the transformation of the man or the woman is gradual. You're not supposed to lay there and stay there. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, don't know the verse. It says, God's will is for you to be holy. So just because this person failed and failed, it's not a green light or an excuse. But this message series is not about the transformation of the Christ follower. I've been preaching that for 15 years. This message series is an invitation into the process of changing and into the the kingdom work, advancing the church, advancing the kingdom of God, and sharing the gospel. That's what this message series is all about. And God can use you even though you fail, even though you're a mess. That's what he wants to do. He wants to use you for his purposes. That's what this message series is all about. And, And listen... One of my favorite sections of scripture is found in Ephesians 4 where it says that, uh, that God places us together perfectly. Why? As each person does their own special work, it helps the others to grow and the whole church is healthy, growing, and full of love. A fully engaged church, that doesn't mean you're paying attention. That means you're all involved in what the church is supposed to do. A fully engaged church is a powerful church 
And so what I'm trying to do in this message series, and ultimately what God's trying to do, is to break down the barriers that keep you out of the game. A fully engaged church is a powerful, high-impact church. But most people in the church, including this one, aren't involved in the day-to-day activities of growing the kingdom through his church. That's his plan. And so we're trying to bust down the walls, bust down the barriers so you can get your butt in the game, okay? Get in the game. Let's talk about Peter, okay? Hey, Ricky. You all know Peter, right? Nobody is going, oh, who's this Peter guy, right? Here's the thing with Peter. Peter, no contenders, absolute sure, the first leader of the church of Jesus Christ, okay? We all know this. He, he walked with Jesus for three, over three years. He saw everything that he was doing. And then in Acts chapter 2, when the church actually begins, he, Jesus has died, and, he is, and he's gone, though, right? He's not hanging out with them anymore. And the Holy Spirit falls at Pentecost, and, and they start speaking in tongues. And Peter, right then and there, first guy, gets up and preaches the first message ever preached in the church of Jesus Christ. And 3,000 people get saved. Boom! That day. Right? That Peter. It's the same Peter in the very next chapter that says that he's with John. He's going down to the temple at 3 o'clock in the afternoon to go to some prayer meeting. That should convict you right there. Right? Monday night prayer, 7 o'clock. Wednesday night prayer, 6 o'clock. Saturday morning prayer, 6 a.m. Honest. Tired of sitting here with two people. Let's get it done. Okay? Prayer at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Did you feel that? Did you guys feel that? You felt that. I hope you felt it. Good. It's like one of them things when you have a bad back and they just turn up the zzz, zzz, just a little bit. Just a t- What is it? A little tens unit. Zzz, zzz, right? Prayer. Prayer. And, and so Acts chapter 3, right? They go to the temple and there's a guy there who's been crippled since birth. A man crippled since birth. So it doesn't say how old he is, but um, how old is he? How old? Throw out a number. He's 40. How old do you think he is? 50, 30? I don't know. Pick a number. He's a man. He's 20, right? So how about this number? Long time. So, so the guy's been there a long, long time, right? He's, he's there every single day, it says, to, to try to get money from, from people that are going into the temple, and he begs for money. He looks at Peter and John, and he, sa- and he says, hey, can I have some money? And Peter looks at him and says, look at me. Got his attention, right? What is he saying? I got nothing. Look at me. My mom would say, I'm a schlumpa. I'm nothing. Look at me. I got nothing. He goes, silver and gold I don't have, but I'll give you what I have. In the name of Jesus, stand up and walk. That Peter. And the dude does. He doesn't just stand up and walk. I love this verse. Right? This story is so awesome. Not only does he get up and walk, it says that his, his feet and his ankles were healed immediately. He stood up, walked, and danced and praised God. Right? That's what he did. That's that, that Peter. That Peter. The Catholics like him so much, he's their first pope. Right? They love this guy. It's that Peter, right? It's that Peter. So let's, let's talk about... Let's talk about Peter for a second. Let's talk about, um, let's not talk about the awesome things I just talked about about Peter. Let's talk about pre-awesome, right? Let's talk about pre-awesome you. Let's talk about pre-awesome Peter. Let's see his call before the awesome stuff happened. And let's look at Matthew chapter 4. Open your Bible to Matthew chapter 4. We're going we're gonna to read five verses, uh, 18 through 22. Mar, uh, Matthew chapter 4, verse 18 through 22. Let me just say, as you're turning there, that the call from God to Peter is told in three different places in the Gospels. It's found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And the longest, the, the most highly detailed is in Luke. But you, and, I, and I would encourage you to read that. Three different authors inspired by the same God to, to document the same story. Luke just happened to give a little bit more detail. But here's, here's uh, Matthew's account. Are you guys all there? Are you? Are you? Are you? Okay. Matthew chapter 4, verse 18. One day as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, also called Peter, 
and Andrew, this is brother, throwing a net into the water, for they fished for a living. Jesus called out to them, come follow me and I'll show you how to fish for people. So that's the old, I mean, you guys probably all learned that a little different. Uh, Follow me, I'll make you fishers of men, right? Everybody knows that one. The the fishers of men. And, And watch this. And they left their nets at once and followed him. Now the next two verses have nothing to do with Peter, but I want to read them anyway because they're worthy of being read. A little further up the shore, he saw two other brothers, James and John, sitting in a boat with their father. So very similar to Andrew and Peter, right? Similar situation. They're sitting there. They're fishermen. But they're sitting there with their dad, that little, that little caveat in there. Zebedee's the dude's name. And they're repairing their nets. I think that Peter and, them and Andrew were, were repairing the nets too. They were, it seems as though they were kind of on the shore throwing the nets out, kind of testing them and getting them prepared for fishing. Uh, they weren't really out on the boat, but they were, seemed to, it seems to be they were on the shore. But anyway, so they're repairing their nets, and he called them. Jesus called to them also, and they immediately followed him, leaving the boat and their father behind. So three different accounts. Uh, all of them are a little bit different. Luke is the most expanded version, but there's one thing that all three of them have. And so when all three of them have it, I think it's something we should really, really pay pay attention to. Okay? All three of them start the exact same way. One day. One day. Just kind of random. Right? The Bible is never afraid to talk about special days. You know, one day on the Sabbath, on the day of preparation before the Passover, uh, on the day of... Pentecost, on the, right? They're always talking about what certain day on the, on a certain moon festival this happened on a certain Sabbath this happened. But in this case, one day, right? Not some special day, not some holiday, not after you know. It wasn't because it was Christmas or or, or New Year's Eve, and there was a special day, and so we. And it wasn't after we graduated and did some awesome accomplishment in life. No, just a random day. This is when God called one day. That's it. One day. And, and, but we're not like that, right? His ways are not our ways. His, his thoughts are not our thoughts. God doesn't see things the way we see things, right? And we're like, we procrastinate stuff, right? We, I, see it in, 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 I see it in baby showers. I see it in weddings. I see it in graduations. I see it in baptisms. What, what's the call to baptize? You get, right? Peter's preaching, and, they, and, and the people are like, hey, what do we do? He goes, uh, repent, turn to God, be baptized. Well, my cousins live in Cleveland, and they won't be until next month, so can we put it off t- to then? Do you see? I mean, when I say that now, you, f- you can feel how dumb that is, right? That, that, there's no room for that, right? So I'm just going to wait till, you know, the moment's right to get married. How many people have been married for a while and realized that there's never been a good moment? You just do it, right? You just do it. I mean, some people have a trophy husband, and it just works out perfectly every single day, right? She's a lucky lady. I know, I know. I'm sorry, she's not lucky. She's blessed. Yeah, she's blessed. Well, that's what we do, right? When this is in place, and when that is in place, and, and when, I, when I get, listen, when I make enough money, and when I get to this house, and when I have this job, and when I graduate school, and when I lose this much weight, and I this and this and this, and then I'll, and God's like, how about right now? How about we just do this right now? Right? One day. One day. Then he goes on. He says, this is kind of cool. One day, he's just walking along the beach. Now, that seems kind of strange to me. He's about to start a movement that's going to sweep the globe. He's the savior of the world, right? He's going he's to save the world. Ever since sin fractured the universe, here's the one fix for that, this dude, Jesus. And he's about to start this kingdom advancing thing that's going to go global and save the universe. And one day, he's just walking along the beach. Seems like an unlikely way to start the greatest movement in the history of the human race. Yeah, that's just what he's going to do. One day, yeah, we see we plan stuff. And we procrastinate and we organize events. We've got to get ready. Just right, just to, just right man. Got to have just the right gown, just the right look, just the right hair, just the right shoes, just the right guests, just the right DJ, just the right food, just the right venue, just the right this, just the right that. And God's like, how about right now? Let's just do that right now. Let's cut to the chase. Let's just do that right now. 
How about you get, to busy, get, to, get busy in my kingdom right here, right now? Okay? You're never going to be good enough looking. You're never going to be skinny enough. You're never going to have the right clothes. Never going to have the right things to say. I'll, you open your mouth, I'll give you the things to say. Right? How about right now? How about right here, right now? We test stuff. We date things for a while. No, I'm not talking about just dating people, right? Oh, I didn't do that. I just married her right away. <laughs> but that's what we generally do, right? We date things, date people, check resumes, try stuff out, take a free trial, figure out if it's going to work for us. God's like, mm, how about right now? How about right now, right? That's not God. God's like, yep, one day. Well, I'm walking along the beach, right? So that's just it. I just want you to notice that, that, that God has no order to this, at least to us. We don't see the order. He might see it in the heavens. He might see it in eternity past when he was going to do this. But to us, it seems very, very random. He could, it could happen at any time, right? He could invade your space at any time. And here's the thing about one day walking along the beach. He comes and he meets you where you are. A lot of us think we have to get to a certain level of goodness and purity and holiness and education and I need to know enough about this and I haven't read the Bible yet so I don't know what we need to do all that before then I can and he's like no you're um you're a fisherman that doesn't know squat about anything how about right now how about you give your life to me right now what's the fisherman's response immediate right immediate boom now listen the luke version says that jesus was preaching out there so maybe these guys actually heard something that jesus was saying maybe that's what made them when he said come they were yeah well yeah this guy's amazing maybe that was or maybe not i don't know if they heard i don't know i wasn't there but hey nick but i do know this their response to Jesus' call was immediate and sacrificial. And that's where we, a lot of us stumble there too. It's not, we put things off, we, ta- we put things off, we put things off until the right moment. There is no right moment, right? There's no right moment and it's sacrificial. We all, we want to jump in at the right time and then give what we feel like we want to give, I'll get Jesus this far and no closer, right? I'll give you certain sections of my kingdom, but I won't let you reign as my king. Got awfully quiet in here. And I know I'm preaching to myself as well, but it's true. God said through the apostle Paul, give your bodies as a living sacrifice to God, that that is your reasonable, acceptable worship we've said this before anything less than that is what unacceptable listen loved ones i'm saying this because i love you don't give him your scraps don't give god your scraps he didn't die on a cross so you could give him an hour on sunday morning keep your stinking hour you give him what he commands, or you can be like the rich young ruler. You can walk. There's the door. Now, I know this is harsh, but read your Bible. Read your Bible. Sacrificial. The guys not only left right away, but it said that they left not only their nets and boats, which is what? Their provision and their identity, but they left their dad. And back then, if you do any study, you understand that the connection with father and son was a lot stronger than it is now. I mean, I know that we, most of them, me and my dad, we got nothing going on. But some of the people in this room have a relationship with their dad. But it's not like it was back then. Like, you were the, you weren't just Michael, you're the son of Ken. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't just Nick. You're the son of Ken. Like, that was part of your identity. You were not a man on your own merit. You were a son of. And these guys immediately left their boats, their nets, and their father to go follow Jesus Christ. And the point of this is, loved ones, is that following Christ is sacrificial. It's sacrificial. 
God can't use me. I have never been ordained. I've never been to seminary. I haven't even read the whole Bible. I don't know what to say. Yada, 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 yada. They're excuses. They're excuses. Peter knew nothing, and he was nothing, and God came calling to use him. Here's the third thing. So it was just one day, just random time, random place, so so it would seem. He could show up at your car dealership Monday. He could show up at your classroom. He could show up right in front of that friar later on Monday morning. I don't know when he's going to show up. He could show up at any time and meet you right where you are. He's not at the football stadium calling you going, Hey, Herb, why don't you come over here? No, he's going to show up in front of your friar later. That's what Jesus does. So here's the third thing about Peter, and you're going to have to look in Acts chapter 4, verse 13, to see the, the third thing about Peter that makes him kind of unqualified, but it might give you hope. Peter is actually in Jerusalem. He is at the epicenter of the faith, right? He, so this Christianity is a, is a continuation of the Jewish faith, okay? You understand? Like my parents, they don't understand why I'm not Jewish anymore. I, I, I am Jewish, right? I've never drained my blood out and started afresh. I'm Jewish, okay? See this nose? I'm Jewish. I'm cheap. I have a big nose. I'm Jewish. I kid. I can do that because I am. It's a continuation. It's a fulfillment. It's, it's, the, it's the glorious results, right? It, it is Judaism, okay? Do you understand? Jesus is Jewish, right? Jesus didn't convert. He celebrated Passover. He celebrated Sabbath. He went to temple. He prayed to this one true God. Like, it, it's Judaism. Do you understand, right? So, so <laughs> he's in Jerusalem at the epicenter of, of Judaism, and he's preaching to the leaders of the main center of Judaism. Like these are the grand poobahs of Judaism. Do you understand? It's kind of like if he walked right into the Vatican and started preaching to the Pope. It's that kind of environment. He walked, he's right there in Jerusalem preaching to the leaders of the Jewish faith, convincing all these people, not just the regular folks, but the leaders, that Jesus is Lord, right? That's crazy. But this is what he's doing. And it goes on to say that Peter, they noticed that Peter was an ordinary man with no special training in the scriptures. The New King James Version says that they were uneducated and untrained men. Now let me ask you guys a question. How many people in this room have have graduated from Bible college or seminary? Raise your hand. Doesn't this give you hope then? I'm not saying don't sign up to go to Bible school and get trained. Like this never says don't get trained. But the people noticed that they were untrained, but did they spoke boldly and effectively. This guy, he preached the message, 3,000 people got saved. It was probably a pretty good message. And they had no training. They were uneducated and untrained men. This is awesome, though. But they noticed they had spent time with Jesus. They were just soaking in the Jesus juice in his presence, right? You could tell. But they were uneducated men. And so that gives us hope. Formal training is good. Formal training should be sought after. You come here every week for stuff like that. I get it, and you should. But formal training and full understanding of the Bible are not prerequisites to partnering with Jesus to advance his kingdom. That's a barrier that needs to come down. It's not, listen, we have to try to convince people you don't have to be right with God to get saved. You get saved, and then you'll get right with God. Well, I hate using all these little Christian platitudes and, and these silly little expressions, but he doesn't call the equipped, he equips the called, right? I hate using stuff like that, but it was just too true. I had to use it, right? He calls people, and then when he calls them, then he equips them for the work of the ministry. And so here's the, here's the common problem that needs a fixin', okay? We remember all these 
Faith Hall of Fame people, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Noah, Moses, all these guys, Samson, all right? We remember all these people because of what they did. And that's awesome what they did. You know, Moses with the Red Sea. That's pretty awesome, right? Got the Ten Commandments, Red Sea, water from a rock, all that kind of stuff, right? Rahab, she, she, she helped protect and save the, the Israeli spies so that they could win the battle and, and get their promised land. Gideon wins battle after battle. and he's, uh, David, he defeats Goliath and he leads this powerful army to conquer all the, the enemies so that Israel's the winner, right? But here's the problem. We tend to compare ourselves to the best version of those heroes. That's what we do. I mean, how many people are, when you think about Moses, whenever you think about Moses, do you ever think about that he was just a shepherd in, like when you just, when Moses pops into your mind, do you think about Moses in the desert as a shepherd doing nothing? Or what are you thinking of? You're thinking about Charlton Heston on the rock. Behold and watch the hand of God. Right? That's what you're thinking about. You think about the great things that he did. When you think about David, right, how many times when you think about David are you just thinking about this little wimpy shepherd boy who plays the harp? No, what are you thinking about? You're thinking about Goliath, right? That's what we do. We compare our little self versus the superhero of the faith and what they did rather than comparing yourself to the pre-awesome David and the pre-awesome Moses. And that's a problem. See, we're talking about the pre-awesome call when they were just like you. That's what I want you to see. So when we preach through the book of Acts and Jesus does all these things in Luke, he preaches all this stuff, he says, I want you to do this, and then the book of Acts comes up and we study what the people actually did, and it's like, wow, awesome stuff, and you're looking at, you, at your life going, I don't do any of that kind of stuff. I can't do any of that stuff. No, you can do that stuff. We see it right here. And we can't compare ourselves to awesome Moses, awesome Gideon, awesome David. Compare yourself now to pre-awesome Moses and pre-awesome David. That's what I want you to see. So, here's where the message gets dangerous. Between the time on the beach... When, when, when Jesus calls Peter to engage into the kingdom, calls him, I want, you to, I want to build this kingdom now. Now's the time. Let's go. Between that time and this time over here when he becomes, uh, when he preaches that amazing message and 3,000 people get saved and he becomes an elder of the church and he, and he stand up and walk and, 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 he, and he write pens first and second Peter, like all that awesome stuff. Between that and, and here at the beach, in that time period, he messed up a lot. Peter messed up a ton. Okay? This should give you some hope. So here's some examples. I want you to see these with your own eyes. Matthew 16. Go there. Go there, go there, go there. Matthew 16, verses 13 through 18. I'm going to read that with you. 13 through 18. Tell me when you're there. Holler. Good, good, good. All right. All right, verse 13. Watch this. Looking for the mess ups, right? See yourself. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the son of man? The son of man is him. He calls himself that, right? So basically it says, who do people say that I am? It's a valid question. You could ask people that now, right? You can go up to people at work, people at the gym, whatever you do. Hey, what, what do you think about this Jesus? What do you think about him? That was the, that was the thing that kind of got me when I got saved. My life was so rotten. I remember waking up one day and going, I wonder if there's anything to this Jesus guy. Boom, that's all you need to ask. That's all you need to ask, and he'll come in like a flood, and he'll tell you exactly who he is. But, but, these, but Jesus goes up to him and says, hey, who do people say that I am? Well, they replied, some say that it's John the Baptist, and some say Elijah, and others say that you're Jeremiah, or maybe one of the other prophets. Okay, good, good, good. Uh, then he asked them, like, I don't care so much about what they say, but let me ask you this, who do you say that I am? And, and, and here's the thing, like, many of them may have answered, I don't know, doesn't say. 
But the one answer that is given is Peter's. Okay, he, sa- he actually speaks up. And he says, you are the Messiah. Some translations would say the anointed one. The Christ, the son of the living God. I mean, Peter knocks this one right out of the park, right? Perfect answer, spot on. Peter's rocking it, and that's awesome, right? And so as a result, look, look what Jesus says. He says, you're the son of the living God, the Messiah, the anointed one. And Jesus replies, you're blessed. You're blessed, Peter, because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any other human being. I mean, just think about this. He's like, Peter, you're right. And it wasn't like me or one of your other rabbis or something taught you this. It wasn't because you were carefully studying the scriptures. We already know they were untrained. Right? They were not trained people. So what ha- he's, got a, this, he's acknowledging that Peter is blessed. Why is he blessed? He's got like this inside track with the sovereign king of the universe. The king of glory is speaking to Peter. That's how awesome this guy is, right? He's not listening to me. He's listening from heaven. He's getting a download from the king, from the throne room of heaven. Peter's getting that message. That's amazing. And, and Jesus acknowledges it. And, and so Peter's just absolutely rocking this thing. He goes on, he says, Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock, and upon this rock I will build my church, and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. The gates of hell, of hell will not prevail. Now we're going to talk about that for a second. I don't know exactly, like there's a play on words there, Bible scholars fight about this, there's certain people that are Christians that say that it's, they're going to build the kingdom on Peter, because he's the rock, and some people believe, and, that's, and I'm in this group, that Christ is the cornerstone, and the reality that Christ is the Messiah, the thing that Peter just said, I believe, he's like, hey, you're a rock, so you'll understand this, on the rock you just said, I'm going to build my church on that. But either way, right, either way you take it, he's, he's, he's telling Peter, man, you're my man, right? You are my man, right? You get it. You know who I am. You you've said it boldly. You know the truth. And we're going to build the church. And as we see in Acts chapter 2, he does use the small rock of Peter to build his church. He's the first preacher. 3,000 people get saved. He writes, he, he performs miracles. He writes scripture. He uses that rock, Right? So Jesus says, you're blessed. You've got a download from heaven. He's absolutely rocking it. But then watch this. Verse 21. From then on, Jesus began to tell his disciples plainly that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem and that he would suffer many terrible things at the hands of the elders, the leading priests, and the teachers of religious law. He would be killed, but on the third day, he would be raised from the dead. Now, pause. We, that's the gospel, right? We know that. That happened. That's amazing. We love it. We rejoice in that good news. It right? hadn't happened yet. No resurrection yet. Peter loves this guy. So he doesn't understand all this fully. And so look at, look at what happens. Verse 22. Give the guy credit. Give him some grace. But Peter took Jesus aside. Picture it. Put yourself in the message, right? Come here, Jesus. Come on. Like you do to your kids that are just so stupid, right? You're like... Jackson, come here, please. So, I could have gone to you, easy. But, like the other day, like my, so, Jameson wanted a snack. And she's not supposed to have a snack. So, Jackson chucked a stick at her. Does that that make any sense at all? So, that's what happened. I come walking in the house, and they've got these toys that you build these, Tents and stuff with the stick with the ball, stick at the ball. You guys, you got kids, you know what I'm talking about, right? He took one of the fiberglass sticks and he whipped it at his, at his sister. I would come walking out, she's screaming, crying. Come here, Jackson. This is what Peter's doing. There's, the, there's, that, there's that you're stupid thing. Like when I, that's what I'm thinking about Jackson, right? What are you thinking? You're dumb. So come here, let me just teach you something. And so Peter, he takes Jesus aside. I don't know what your Bible says. Mine says, and he reprimands him. He rebuked God. (laughs) He's stupid. This is Peter. A second ago, 
You are blessed. I'm going to build the whole thing on you, you moron. This is Peter. <clears throat> Massive failure. Massive failure. I, I don't want to spend too much on this next one. It's just an honorable mention. I don't want to dwell there on Peter's protest of Jesus when Jesus is going to wash his feet. So he reprimands Jesus and he protests Jesus. Failure. Okay? But let's march onward to the most famous of Peter's epic failures as a called and chosen disciple of Jesus Christ. We're talking about his, Jesus' arrest. Look at Matthew 26. I mean, I'm hoping this has given you some hope. Like, man, I'm a buffoon too, but I think Jesus might be able to use me. Matthew 26, verses 69 through 75. Tell me when you're there. You're not supposed to go that fast. I need coffee. I'm happy you guys came to church today. It's cool. How many people are regretting coming to church today? Right? I'm just saying, I always say, who thinks it's a good idea to come to church? And everyone's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the next week, they're not there. So I tried a different approach. How many people are regretting this? I should have gone home. I should have gone to the football game. All right, Matthew 26, 69 through 75. You there, right? Okay, so Peter, um, Jesus had just gotten arrested, right? He's getting ready to get put on the cross. It's a bad day. It's a tough day. And, and Peter, has been, he's been walking with Jesus. He's done all this stuff with him. And he said, hey, you're the Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah. And we're going to build a church on you, Peter. And Jesus gets arrested. And you think a rock like that would like stand firm, but watch this. Meanwhile, Peter was sitting outside the courtyard and a servant girl came over and said to him, you're one of those with Jesus, the Galilean. And, but Peter denied it in front of everyone, not just to the girl. That's a big thing, right? Everyone. He denied it in front of everyone. Don't take the word of God lightly. Listen to what it says. He denied it in front of everyone. And he says this, I don't know what you're talking about, he said. Later, out by the gate, another servant girl noticed him and said to those standing around him, this man was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again, Peter denied it. This is getting serious. This time with an oath. This time with an oath. And he says, I don't even know the man, he said. A little later, some of the other bystanders came over to Peter and said, you must be one of them. We could tell by your Galilean accent. Peter swore. Man, no wonder why... Jesus says in the Gospels, don't even make an oath. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Don't, 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 don't step over this line, man. And this, and this guy does it big time. <laughs> Epic failure. He says, a curse on me if I'm lying. I don't know the man. And immediately the rooster crowed. Now I got to tell you something. It's not part of my notes. But Jesus said, if you deny me before men, I will deny you before my father. So you, if you deny him like Peter did, you are not going to have, There's no, hey, he's with me. That's not happening. And so praise God, he does repent and turn. Because by no means will, will Christ ever turn away anyone who comes to him. You repent and turn, he comes. I mean, he's come rushing, you're, I'm, I'm, you're in, you're in. No matter what you've done, you could go kill someone right now, but if it's a genuine repentance and turn to God, right back in the kingdom. Right? That's, that, that's, that's the truth, and that's the scary part of the gospel, but it's true. And you put that in the hands of a sinner, right? Don't do it. Because people can say, oh, I can do that. Listen, that's not an encouragement to do it, because like I said, 1 Thessalonians, God's will is for you to be holy. God said, be holy for I am holy. Okay? <clears throat> so, he denies him before all the people. And immediately the rooster crowed. Suddenly Jesus' words flashed through Peter's mind. And these were Jesus' words he had said to him previously. Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times that you even know me. And he went away weeping bitterly. 
Not only was this an epic failure on Peter's behalf, but it's only worsened by what happened an hour beforehand. And I want you to see what happened an hour beforehand. You can go back 30 or so verses in that same chapter to verse 31. And look, look what Peter says. On the way, Jesus told them, Tonight all of you will desert me. For the scriptures say, God will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have been raised from the dead, I will go ahead of you to Galilee and meet you there. And Peter declares this, even if everyone else deserts you, I will never desert you. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, Peter, this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times that you even know me. No, Peter insisted, even if I have to die with you, I will never deny you. And all the other disciples vowed the same. And what does he do? The moment he's arrested, he denies him and runs away like a baby. (laughs) Absolute epic failure so let's cut to the chase have you had some failure in your life have you had some failure in your life post conversion since you bowed the knee to Jesus have you had some things in your life that Jesus although he loves you would probably make him cringe a bit have you done some things that might make you think that God couldn't use me because I fill in the blank. Well, just remember this, that all the miracles that Peter performed and all the preaching that Peter did that saw thousands come to Christ and get baptized and the penning of 1 and 2 Peter as an elder of the church of Jesus Christ All of this happened after Peter's failures. Now check this out. We're almost done. There's a caveat that I need you to see in Peter's I'll never desert you, uh, I'll even die for you story. And it's actually found in the Gospel of Luke. In Luke's account of this story, I want you to see that it's not in the Matthew account. Look in Luke 22. And then we're almost done. Luke 22 is something you need to see. Just before this denial, just before the rooster crows stuff, right? Just before that happens, Luke adds into the story something of this conversation that Matthew neglected to put in. And I don't know why he neglected. That's up to the Holy Spirit. It's not my thing. But I'm praising God right now that he put it in Luke. Luke chapter 22, verse 31 Peter is with Jesus, and Jesus looks at him and says, Peter, Satan has asked to sift each of you like wheat. He's going to mess with you. And we see that it's, Satan does a really good job in that one. He, he makes Peter deny Jesus three times, and he walks away weeping bitterly. Satan had his way with Peter that day. And that's why Jesus, when, 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 when Peter denies him, what does Jesus say? Get behind me, Satan. Remember that? Now this is minutes after he says, Peter, you're blessed. You heard from the Father. I'm the anointed one. And then he, he reprimands Jesus and Jesus says, get away from me, Satan. In like, in like a minute. The devil has asked to sift you, Peter. But I have pleaded for you in prayer. I have pleaded for you in prayer that your faith should not fail. So when you have repented, in other words, you're going to mess up. You don't need to repent if you don't mess up, right? When you have repented and turned back to me again, strengthen your brothers. And that's when Peter says, Lord, I'm ready to go to prison with you. I'm even ready to die with you. Jesus prayed for him. He knew he was going to mess up. He had plans for Peter, and we see the plans play out. Miracle after miracle, he wrote scripture, man. He built the church on Peter. And thousands of people got saved through his message that day at Pentecost. 
And Jesus said, I know you're going to mess up, but when you're, I've pleaded in prayer for you. And why is that so encouraging for us? Two verses. Just listen. Romans 8, 34. Who then will condemn us? No one. For Christ Jesus died for us. He died for me. He died for you. He died for you. He died for Peter. And he was raised to life for us. And he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand, pleading for us. That's why. Here's another one. Hebrews 7, chapter, chapter 7, verse 25. Therefore, Jesus is able once and forever to save those who come to God through him. And he lives forever to intercede with God on their behalf. That's why the story about being sifted and being prayed for for Peter is so important to you. Because Jesus Christ this minute is doing the same thing for you. That's why. He's, when you, he knows. He's, he's, like, he's like me with Jackson. He's, like, he's looking at his father. He's going, yeah, I know. I know. I know. I know. I know. But he's with me. So will you let him in anyway? Absolutely. He's pleading for you. You're not in it alone. You're being pleaded for right now. And he sees your mistakes. And the enemy is asked to sift you too. Don't make no mistake about it. And you will be sifted and you will be thrown around and beaten up and used for Satan sometimes. I know this is a harsh word, but Peter, the rock that God built the church with, the, the, the blessed man who heard from the Father that Jesus was the anointed one and he performed miracles and penned scripture. Epic failure. Epic failure. But God still used him. So in closing, I would just say, loved ones, whether you've never stepped into purpose, I mean stepped into purpose. And when I mean purpose, I mean everything was created by him and for him. Amen. And, and purpose means the real reason why you live. The, the real reason why he went to the... He, listen, he didn't go to the cross so you could be a good car salesman. He didn't go to the cross so you could be a good husband. He didn't go to the cross so I could be a good preacher. He didn't go to the cross to give you a nice life. He went to the cross to save you and, and have you get into what, you're, what you were intended to live for. To build his kingdom. That's why you're breathing. Do you understand this? Get off the fence, y'all. He saved you so he could use you to build his kingdom. And anything other than that is not the right use of your life. Don't throw God your scraps. Don't throw God your scraps. So if you've never stepped into purpose, if you've never stepped into active participation in building God's kingdom because you don't feel qualified, or maybe you've done some things. Maybe, maybe you used to be actively involved. Maybe you used to pursue Jesus with a great passion personally. Maybe you used to serve Jesus radically. Maybe you used to share Jesus relentlessly with people. But then you failed in some way. And now you don't feel unqualified. You feel disqualified. And I would just say this, loved ones. Let God's story with Peter bear its weight on God's story with you. Everything was created by Him and for Him. And that verse right here, there's no star down here that says, yeah, but... No circumstance, no failure, no unqualified thing that you might conjure up in your mind that keeps you either unqualified or disqualified for living for Him. Those things are only made up. They're not real. He wants to bust through all that and call you into purpose. 
if you're sensing that there's a longing in your life, that, that there's just something, there's just something missing. I don't feel like I have this, this, when I wake up in the morning, I don't feel like I've got this purpose, like intentionality, like some real reason, some deep, awesome, powerful reason to get up and do something with your life. Like they're just going to work ain't cutting it. It's because going to work ain't going to cut it. He's, he wants you, to, he saved you to use you to build his kingdom. And that's the only satisfying life. That's the only life that you can live that doesn't make you long for something else ever. Ever. And I'm pleading with you. As if God was speaking through me now. Give your bodies as a living sacrifice to God. That that's your reasonable worship. Lord, if there's a king of failure, it's the guy talking right now. Nobody else's sin is as great as mine. But nobody's God is greater than mine. And you have used the foolish things right here. You've used the powerless things to shame the wise and powerful. I thank you, Lord, that you sucked me out of the American dream. You sucked me out of my own selfish desires. You saved me from that wretched life. So I'm just going to pray the way I feel led to pray. God, I I would ask that you'd help us to get rid of the thought that there's a radical approach to Christianity. There's really only one approach to Christianity. It's Christianity itself. Your word is our framework. Your word is the definition of Christianity. What does it mean to follow Christ? It's right here in your book. I thank you for it, Lord, and I pray that you'd help us to bust down these barriers that we, that we form, that others try to form for us, that culture forms, that religion forms. I pray that you'd break down anything that I have maybe put up that would keep others from a greater walk with you. I just want people to love you, serve you, worship you, obey you, fear you, walk with you. And I'm just saying, Lord, as as the pastor of this church, without permission from anybody, I'm asking you to wreck lives and make people want to do this like you did to me. You wrecked me. And I want you to wreck these folks. And anyone who would be watching online, wreck them. Wreck them. And give them such an uneasy, unsatisfied feeling for their life right now that only could be answered with a greater relationship and greater service to you. That's why you died. Lord, um, I thank you for your word and I thank you for every single person that's here today. And I pray, Lord, that as the week goes on and they go back and they check what's been said and they check their notes and check the scripture verses, Lord, that you'll continue to speak to them. Much like you did with Peter, Father, just speak to them. Let them hear your voice. loved ones we're here for a special occasion now Um, a timeless tradition in the in our faith when uh, parents who understand that their child is not 
really owned by them, but just a gift from heaven. And they're just to steward these kids the best that they can. Um, Our hope and desire is that each and every child that we have in our families would just grow up to love and serve Jesus. I mean, that's, we could say a bunch of other little details, but at the end of the day, that's, I don't care if my kid collects garbage or whatever, you know, whatever. I just want him to love and serve Jesus. That's, that's it. So, and um, it started out with um, Hannah as she brought Samuel to the temple and, and he said, you know, God, if you give me a baby, I'll I'll give him back to you, and he can serve you for the rest of his life. And, uh, and she did that. And Joseph and Mary, they did the same thing with Jesus. They brought G- baby Jesus back to the temple and, and, and dedicated him to the Lord. They recognized that this child was not really their own. They're just there to take care of the child and do what they could to kind of, they didn't really have to do a whole lot. God had, God had the, the cards de- you know, stacked in, in Jesus' favor. They didn't have to do a whole lot to get Jesus to be righteous. But for us, we, we need to because our kids are born sinners. And so what we're supposed to do is to help lead them to know and love and worship the Lord. That's our job. So, and uh, Michael and Haley, why don't you come on up here. And Michael and Haley want to do that with little baby Elijah there this morning. And say hello to them. Ken. Oh, you got one already. All right, cool. Comes prepared. So they want to do that this morning. So there's baby Elijah. See him? You guys... He's, he's kind of tucked underneath the, the little hood there sometimes. You can't really see the cuteness, but pretty adorable. And uh, so I, wanna, I just want to say a couple things first, and then I'm going to step back and let Michael lead his family, lead him well. But um, I just want to ask two things, and uh, just looking for a, a straight-up answer. And that is, um, we're supposed to, as parents, do our very best, by God's grace, to, uh, to teach our children this, teach them about the Lord, right? Share God's word with them, pray with them. And then also to model before our children what it's like to be a Christ-like man or a Christ-like mom and woman, right? That's what we're supposed to do. And so um, when you dedicate your child to the Lord, you're, you're really, you're not dropping them off at the temple, praise God, but you're, 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 you're committing to doing that, okay? And so I just want to ask you, before all these witnesses, your church family, Michael and Haley, do you commit today by God's grace to teach your son the word of God, teach him about Jesus and to model Christ-like character before his eyes so he would know and love Jesus? Yes. Yeah, awesome. And then, um, and then also I just want to say that you, you, know, you are a church family, you are the church, you're his church family. And so I just want to ask you, and don't take this lightly, I want to ask you, will you do the same? Will you do, will you take time, like intentional, purposeful time to spend time pouring into not only to to Elijah, but to Michael and Haley and help them in their endeavor to see this little dude right here come to know and love Jesus. And so that means helping them with responsibilities. That means helping them with time, with financial things, with teaching the child, whatever it is that they would need to help him, to help that little guy someday be in there. So would you do that? Don't take it lightly. Count the cost before you do it. Will you do that? Awesome. I want to pray real quick and then I'm going to pass it on to uh, Michael. Um, Father, we're just here in your presence right now. And uh, don't take that lightly. And it's not that any of us are awesome in any way that we could even speak to you right now. But only because of Jesus, only because of his sacrifice, that that curtain is open, that we could come in and even talk to you, Father. So we are grateful, humbled, fearful. We understand that we don't have a place in this, in this throne room aside from your son. That being said, Lord, we, you said we could come boldly. So we're coming boldly now, Lord, to just offer you praise. Praise you for this little guy right here. Thank you for his life. Thank you for Michael and Haley and, and, and putting this little son into their life and giving them the opportunity to, yet, to make yet another disciple of Jesus. That's so awesome, Lord. We just pray, Lord, that someday, someday soon, that we will see little Elijah repent of sin, turn to you, and be baptized. 
And so, Lord, we thank you for his salvation. Now we're asking you for it. And we're praising you right now. And we're asking you to help us to fulfill our commitments that we've made here today. In Jesus' name, amen. I really just want to go into prayer with God. I I don't want to say much, but I do want to pray. Father, um, we... I remember several months ago, Lord, that um, I was so afraid. I was so afraid you were going to take my son. I was afraid you're going to take him before we got a chance to meet him. And for 15 minutes I cried to you. I wailed like a baby. And you came down and you told me it would be okay. And I trusted you. And then two months ago, Elijah was born. And you came down and you breathed your life into his nostrils and into his lungs. You filled him with breath. You were there when he was born. You were there when I was fearful for his life. And even when Haley started bleeding out and dying, you spoke to me directly and told me she would be okay. You have been there every step of the way, and I know that to be true. How the weight of that truth collapses me. I pray, Lord, that this little boy, every day of his life would be filled with a great faith that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, and that you, God, Father in heaven, will be with him by his side in every moment in every mountaintop experience and in every valley of the shadow of death experience that this little boy would know that Yahweh, the great I am, is standing over him and protecting him. Hallelujah. Lord, I do not ask that you make him a great man. I ask that you make him a meek and humble man who worships a great God. Yes. Don't let me screw that up. (laughs) Don't let Haley screw that up. I look at my son, Lord, and I think, why? Why me? At two months old, I can see he has the gentleness of Christ. He has a very gentle spirit, Lord, and I think, why? Why? I understand giving me Elena. She's like a bull in a china shop, but this little boy is so sweet. This little boy, Lord, is so sweet and gentle. Maybe the purpose for giving someone like me, someone so sweet and gentle, is that I would learn from him. Lord, I pray that 
I can lead him and Haley can lead him and we can teach him all the truths of the Bible and all your truth, Father God, that we would lead him up the way he should go so that if he ever wandered, he would know the way back. Yep. But Father, I pray you teach him directly. Speak to him and let him teach us the things you need to teach us. We thank you, Father God, for this beautiful baby boy. Yes. We thank you for all of our children. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. 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 Awesome. I'm going to ask whoever's willing to come forward and grab these baskets. We're going to give our offerings to the Lord right now. We want to just show thanksgiving and uh, participation in in the kingdom of God and advancing his purposes and we do that through our giving too so we pray we study we fellowship um, we share the gospel and we give generously you know um, those who uh, give generously will prosper and those who are stingy lose everything and those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed and so keeping those things in mind I just want you to take a moment and uh, talk to the Lord about that you know what does that look like for you you know he's called you here to this church to be a part of this family to advance his purposes and his efforts through this ministry so just give accordingly so just take a few moments and pray to the Lord yourself and let the Holy Spirit speak to you and then whatever he says we'll take a moment and then there'll be some baskets come around the room and I just ask you to give according to what how you're led and um, if you don't want to do the basket you don't have to there's boxes on the back wall and there's giving you can go to a little giving computer out there on the in the lobby underneath that TV and there's a square card you know whatever you want to do but just pray and ask the Lord what to do and give accordingly and they'll come around in just a moment